Hello, and welcome to FP Innovation's Residual Harvesting Best Practices presentation. This presentation is a summarization of the best management practices for integrated harvest operations in British Columbia guidebook, available on FP Innovation's website. It is intended for resource managers interested in further utilization of logging residuals. Topics will include a description of residual piles and components and outline best practices for both primary and secondary harvesters. Logging Residue Composition We will begin by defining the factors that affect the composition of logging residue piles and the main components that can be found within them. There are a wide variety of factors that can affect the composition of residue piles. These factors can include merchantability specifications, such as topping diameters or minimum grades, harvest prescriptions, such as clear cut or partial cut, operator technique, or how much care is taken to preserve the integrity of the residual pieces and how neatly the residues are piled. Species harvested. Tree form can vary greatly between species and especially between coniferous and deciduous trees. And terrain profile. Rough or broken terrain can lead to higher breakage rates and shorter piece sizes. However, most piles are made up of a mix of tops, longbots, and brush. The next few slides will describe each of these in turn. A top is the uppermost piece of a tree left over after the saw logs and or pulp logs have been removed. Logs below minimum grade are also included in this designation. A long butt is the lowermost piece of a tree that is often cut off and disposed of due to quality problems, such as rot or excessive sweep. Long butts are shorter than the minimum grade length, which is usually 3 meters. Brush refers to the branches, needles, and loose bark removed from the tree stem during the processing phase of logging. The proportion of tops, long butts, and brush in an average pile varies according to stem size and stand age. Second growth stands, or stands with small piece sizes, tend to have, by weight, a higher proportion of tops versus long butts and brush, whereas old growth stands, or stands with large piece sizes, tend to have a higher proportion of long butts. This is generally due to higher levels of rot and other defects in old growth stands, especially in the lower portion of the tree. However, please note there can be significant variance from the averages shown here. Best Practices for the Primary Harvester Primary harvesters cut saw logs and pulp logs on the first pass. This section will describe some of the practices that they should consider when planning their harvest and when handling the residue they create. Planning in the planning stage, planners need to consider how much biomass might be available, how it will be harvested, and how and where it will be transported. By determining the answer to these questions, planners can decide whether larger turnarounds for chip fans and or loop roads need to be established in the primary harvest stage, thus saving significant time and money for the secondary harvester. Communication Communication between primary and secondary harvesters is critical and needs to start early in order to ensure maximum efficiency of both operations. Deactivated roads or residues piled for burning can add significant costs to the secondary harvester and may not always be necessary. In a recent FP Innovation study, as much as $6 per cubic meter was added to the secondary harvester's cost when they were required to break apart burn piles before chipping. If the residue piles had not been piled for burning, the primary harvester would have saved the time and money required to build them, and the secondary harvester would not have had to incur the cost of breaking them apart. The traditional practice of primary harvesters is to build residue piles that facilitate burning. These are often in a haystack or cone shape, or in some cases, 
a long windrow if enough residue is present. In the fall, when fire conditions are optimal, the piles are then often burned. The smoke created from burning these piles can sometimes be problematic if venting conditions become poor during the burn. In the creation of burn piles, the individual residue pieces get very tangled and are difficult to handle by secondary harvesters. FP Innovations is suggesting a new method of piling residues, called oriented piling, that is conducive to handling residues by secondary harvesters. Processor operators simply drop the residue top parallel in a deck-like pile instead of scattering or flinging tops after the main stem is processed. To date, two studies, one in the interior of BC and one on the coast, have demonstrated that there is no difference in productivity for processors when carefully dropping the top in oriented piles versus scattering or flinging tops. Pile Formation Because not all residues will be harvested by a secondary user, FP Innovations developed a protocol to help operators understand when traditional piling for burning or the new oriented method should be implemented. Some of the factors that affect the decision to implement oriented piling are the distance from the end user, the type of collection including grinding, chipping, or collecting unprocessed residues, the road grade accessing the site, and the steepness of the slope expressed as cut or fill slope height. If residues will be ground up at roadside for hog fuel, tops should be aligned using the oriented piling method. Long butts and brush should be kept separate from the tops. If the hog fuel will be used for pellet feedstock, long butts should be kept separate from brush. If residues will be chipped for pulp at roadside, tops should be aligned using the oriented piling method. If the operator is making fuel chips, which is a substitute for hog fuel, then long butts should be piled separately. Brush tends to collect sand and dirt, so it is not appropriate for pulp chips or fuel chips. Therefore, brush should be either piled for burning or spread to avoid concentrations. If the operator collects residue for grinding or chipping at a remote site or satellite yard, then tops should be aligned using the oriented piling method. Long butts should be piled separately. Brush should be piled for burning or spread to avoid concentrations. Processor and loader operators should follow the general guidelines on the screen if there is a possibility of secondary harvest. Operators sometimes question the value of oriented piling. However, there are benefits for the licensee in the form of reduced piling and burning costs. There are also reduced costs for the secondary harvester when moving residues to roadside, loading unprocessed residues for transport, and in grinding at roadside. As discussed earlier, there is no increased cost to processors when building oriented piles provided that operators are cognizant of the balance between productivity and pile neatness. Taking too much time to make the piles too neat will affect productivity. A question that operators ask is, when should I build oriented piles and when should I pile for burning? There are three parts to the answer. The first part of the answer is only when the piles are within an economically feasible distance for the secondary user. If the piles are beyond this range, residue can be piled for burning. The second part of the answer is dependent on the road accessing the residue. If the road grades are too steep for chip fans and equipment to access the site, residues can then be piled for burning. However, an effort should be made to understand the limitations of potential secondary harvesters before deciding which method to use.
The third part of the answer to the question, when should I build oriented piles and when should I pile for burning, is dependent on the cut or fill slope beside the road. As terrain grows steeper, road builders are required to cut earth from the hillside to create the base of the road. This often leaves a vertical wall beside the road which inhibits the harvesting of residues at roadside. As the terrain gets steeper, the cut slope typically gets taller. Before deciding which method of piling to use, operators should communicate with the secondary harvester to find out what limitations they may have regarding cut slope height. Best Practices for Secondary Harvesters This section will describe some of the practices that secondary harvesters should consider when planning their harvest, managing the quality of their product, and leaving a site after completion. As stated earlier in this presentation, communication between primary and secondary harvesters is critical and needs to be started early. In many cases, Primary harvesters are unfamiliar with the needs and systems of the secondary harvester. A site visit to speak to the primary harvester may help open the lines of communication and improve the understanding of what is necessary for the secondary harvester to be productive and operate economically. Secondary harvesters should familiarize themselves with the road systems of potential work sites prior to harvest. Identifying steep road sections and road upgrade issues can make the difference between an economic and uneconomic operation. Roadside chipping operators should make sure there is adequate space to operate their chipper, and all operators should make sure there is adequate turnaround space for their chip vans. Secondary harvesters should understand that they are required to adhere to the same rules and regulations as primary harvesters. When in doubt, secondary harvesters should consult the licensee, the primary harvester, and or the Ministry of Forest, Lands, Natural Resource Operations, and Rural Development for more information. Contamination of end products can be very costly for both the secondary harvester and the end product user. Secondary harvesters should always attempt to keep contaminants out of their product and should be watchful of things that may damage their machinery. Large pieces of metal or rock can cause tens of thousands of dollars in repairs. Sand and hog fuel destined for the pellet mill can damage pellet dyes and reduce their working lifespan by as much as 50%. Moisture can also be problematic for end users, especially those that create a product using combustion. The energy derived from wet feedstock is less than that from dry feedstock. Pellet manufacturers are required to dry their feedstock to a very low moisture content. They prefer lower moisture content to reduce drying costs. The most effective strategy that can be employed to prevent induction of contaminants into end product is to simply leave contaminated material at roadside to be later burned or spread back into the cut block. Secondary harvesters may have to pull stumps from piles, clear snow, or simply pass on piles that are considered too dirty. Snow can be problematic for secondary harvesters as it tends to melt while passing through machinery. The operator should be aware that feedstock could freeze inside the truck if wet chips or hog fuel is loaded directly into the truck when the outside temperature is below freezing. This would be very difficult and costly to unload. In heavy snow areas, primary operators should attempt to make residue piles higher to allow access to residues that are free of snow. After the secondary harvester is finished, operators should make sure that there are adequate spots for reforestation and that the fire fuel level has been sufficiently reduced. If unsure, secondary harvesters should discuss with the licensee or primary harvesters to make sure that these issues have been handled appropriately.
Please remember that communication between primary harvesters and secondary harvesters is key. We need to understand how both sides function, and to get that understanding, we need to speak to each other. As you are here viewing this presentation today, it likely means you are interested in how we can further utilize our logging residues and make the most of a limited resource. Don't be afraid to try new methods of handling or to try finding new ways of utilizing what we previously thought of as waste. Thank you for watching our residue handling presentation. If you are interested in more information on residue handling or forest biomass in general, please visit our website at www.fpinnovations.ca.